Good day. I'm Norman Wahlberg. In the last few videos in this series on Mathematics Foundations, we've been looking at Euclid's Elements, the most important mathematics book of all time. Despite its serious importance as a model for mathematics research and exposition, and as an instructive manual for students, Euclid does have some flaws. Some of them we've pointed out already. The main difficulty throughout is that the definitions are weak. We don't really know what we are talking about when we study Euclid. This is a very serious difficulty and it's one that has to be surmounted. However, there are other difficulties too, as began to be appreciated in the 19th century. Euclid makes many assumptions which aren't officially built into his postulates. For example, he makes assumptions about the intersections of things. He assumes that two lines that cross like this actually meet at a point. Although that's physically very intuitively reasonable, it's not actually a consequence of his postulates and definitions. Here's another example. When he constructs a perpendicular to a line through a point, he first uses his compass to get these two points, and then he draws two circles, and when those two circles intersect, we get a line. However, the problem is, again, that these two circles that we've drawn, how do we know that those two circles actually intersect? Euclid just assumes it. Other assumptions are related to congruence. Euclid uses proper motions, or things like translations, rotations, implicitly throughout his work. This is the way he describes equality between geometrical objects. But he never says very clearly what he means by such a transformation and what kind of transformations we're actually considering. Another difficulty has to do with continuity and assumptions about the nature of the real line. Some of these issues are more subtle and we're going to talk about them later when we talk about the continuum. He also has assumptions about betweenness, that although he never says so, it's important in some of his arguments that we know whether a point like this B is between A and C or not in between A and C. We've also seen that the later books on solid geometry and three-dimensional geometry are weaker. They don't really hang together quite as solidly as the first four or five books. But I think we need to return to the critical issue of definitions. In mathematics, it's crucial that we know exactly what we are talking about. And Euclid's elements just does not make the grade when it comes to saying precisely what it is he's talking about. Unfortunately, he has been a role model in that regard for many people who write geometry books. It's become accepted that when it comes to geometry, we don't really have to say what it is that we're talking about. This is a very unfortunate situation and one that we need to seriously correct. And we are going to correct it. But first, let's have a look at some developments that resulted from these logical flaws. Around the beginning of the 20th century, the difficulties of Euclid could no longer be avoided. Bertrand Russell wrote uh, an important essay called The Teaching of Euclid, where he laid out very clearly some of the logical difficulties that people had been ignoring. David Hilbert, who was one of the most prominent mathematicians of the time, certainly realized the importance of not only acknowledging Euclid's difficulties, but also overcoming them. He wrote a book called The Foundations of Geometry, which was very influential with mathematicians, but completely ignored by mathematics educators. In it, he proposed a new framework for a geometry. Unfortunately, his new framework was much more complicated than Euclid's, because he decided to pursue a path called now formalism, where one does not actually bother defining the main terms. So, uh, nature of what is a point, what is a line, what is congruence, what is betweenness. These are all undefined notions for Hilbert. He just makes clear what he wants to do with those notions. In other words, the rules and the relations that those notions have to satisfy with regard to each other. So 
So in some sense, mathematics in this framework becomes a game with symbols which don't have any meaning, but with prescribed rules by which we can operate. For high school teachers, it was completely impossible. But nevertheless, Hilbert's attempt was a valiant one, and one that caused a lot of subsequent mathematicians to have serious reservations about the possibilities of setting up geometry correctly. If David Hilbert could not come up with a good system for foundations of geometry, then most mathematicians felt that it was impossible. This was just in the too hard basket. As a result, the direction of geometry, both in research and in teaching, dramatically changed in the 20th century. Abstraction flourished. Theories became more and more complicated, while the foundations of the subject languished. At the level of teaching, there was a steady decline of geometry in schools. Throughout the century, the amount of geometry that was taught lessened and lessened to the extent that now, in places like New South Wales, high school students almost learn no geometry. This is a dreadful state of affairs. What do we need? We need to overcome the difficulties. We need to step up to the plate and set up proper foundations for a geometry. It turns out that this is not in the too hard basket at all. In fact, it's possible to do it in both a simple and elegant way that everybody can understand. What we need is a new and proper foundation for geometry. And we're going to give that. We need to revitalize geometrical intuition, rigor, and practice in schools. And we need to convince people that geometry really is a dynamic subject that connects with so many aspects of real life. With graphics, computer design, surveying, engineering, astronomy, many other subjects. So our next task is to show how we begin laying out foundations for geometry in a good elementary and basic way. We're going to start just with the framework for arithmetic that we've already developed in the arithmetic part of this foundation series. So please have a look at that series again if you need reminding. And next time we're going to start laying out foundations of geometry in a correct and good way. I hope you're going to join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.